the resurrection of our Lord, which we do every, each and every Sunday morning. And then this week also that we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Um, I pray that each of you had a great week this week and enjoyed family and friends as we come and we gather here in God's house this morning to worship our Lord and Savior. You know, do you remember how last week we talked about uh, his disciples and had been arguing and over the kingdom of heaven in the beginning of, of this passage, and we're in ch chapter 18 in Matthew. Uh, we'll be back in chapter 18 today, as, and we'll be reading from verse 10 in just a moment. But a couple of weeks ago, we, we started off this chapter by talking about the disciples arguing. They were juggling for position, for status, they, the way that unbelieving people in the world would do. But Jesus lets them know that in his kingdom, greatness is not valued by the world's standards, by this world's standards. We need to remember that as Christians, that what the world, how the world judges, God judges much differently. Matthew tells us, then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, back in verse 2 and 4 of this chapter, I say to you, unless you are converted and become a, as little children you will not by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus set this little child in their midst as a living illustration that anyone who comes to him, anyone who comes to Christ with saving faith, has the humility of a child. That is not boasting of their own righteousness, not bragging about their own capabilities, not demanding that everything be explained to their own intellectual satisfaction, or not insisting that everything be given to them on their own terms. That's, that's the way a prideful person comes. But a, a child comes with expectation and love, and that's the way we come to Christ. A little child doesn't respond in that manner. A, a child simply and gladly comes, loving him, trusting him, offering nothing to God, but rather gladly receiving everything from him. That should be indicative of your life. You, you should be not seeking to offer God anything when you come to him, but rather receiving everything from him. When I think of this, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, first started reading in verse 26 through 31. And I believe this is a perfect commentary on what it means to come to Jesus in the humble faith of a little child. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers and said, For you all see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us as wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. It's a perfect illustration of us coming to Christ and how we are the foolish things of the world. It's hard to have pride when you think of that word foolish, isn't it? Do you think of yourself right now, and when you hear the word fool, oh, I'm not foolish. Well, you better hope you are when it comes to the things of the world. You know, so I wanted to set that stage again as we, we dive back into this, the gospel of, of Matthew. You know, very often human beings will exert a great deal of effort to find something that we lose, right? That we, that's something of value or something that we love when it's lost. If we think we have lost our wedding ring, I mean, that's a terrible thing. Uh, if you lose your wedding ring and you'll do anything, I mean, you'll tear apart the kitchen sink to find that ring. Dog owners, 
will spend a great deal of time searching for their pet if it goes missing. They'll spend hours and they'll walk or they'll drive through neighborhoods looking for that lost animal. And they might even put pictures up. We've all seen that on the, on the uh, street signs and for lost animal reward. But this morning, we're going to be taking a look at, today we're going to see something that's much more value than any inanimate object that you might possess or any other object or pet in your life. We're going to see what God thinks of his elect. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? We'll be reading from chapter 18, starting in verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and goes in search of the one that was astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven the, that, that one of these little ones should perish. Father God, we have heard you speak to us audibly this morning as we have proclaimed your word. And Father, as your people gather today in this place, in this hour, Father, let our hearts and minds be focused on your word. Help me, Father, a mere man that stands before your people, present your truth accurately and faithfully. And Father, may this be an encouragement to the faithful and a warning to those who do not know you, Father, and a call of repentance this morning, Father, to the one whose heart is hardened. Turn a heart of stone into a heart of flesh this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So we've all read this parable more than likely if you've been in church or you may not even be a believer and you have heard the parable of the lost sheep and i want to divide it into three sections this morning the first uh, that we're going to dive into is in verse 10 which is the father's warning and then we're going to talk about the father's desire and then the father's will so let's look First, at the Father's warning in verse 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now before I get into verse 10, you've probably noticed in your Bibles, unless you have a King James Bible, that there is no verse 11 here. The verse is not found in the earliest and best Greek manuscripts. That's why it's not in here. I say this when we come across verses like this, and what happens is that um, when the Dead Sea Scrolls and other manuscripts were found after the King James Version of the Bible was written, they found that the earliest manuscripts didn't contain verse 11 in it. So that's why it's not in here. You'll see, probably see a footnote in your Bible. Uh, a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament concludes that it was obviously borrowed from Luke 19.10, most likely with the intention of providing a connection between verses 10 and 12. When you do, but I, I didn't want to just skip over it without giving you an explanation like what happened in the world to my Bible Did somebody get in here a race number 11. When you despise a person here, and we see that in verse 10, when you despise a person, you treat them with contempt. When you say you despise something, you know, what, what comes to your mind? And you think of that person or thing as being worthless when you despise something. To despise one of these little ones, in other words, any Christian is to treat one of God's own precious and beloved children with disdain and contempt is utterly unscriptural. To treat fellow believers with disdain or contempt Little ones, as we have learned, refers to the children uh, uh, of God. That's who they are. Every time you come across uh, that word, term, children, here in, in chapter 18 specifically, the children of God, we are talking about fellow believers. That means that all believers 
including the 12 apostles here, God's describing as little children. Since Scripture doesn't stand on its own in the sense that we must interpret Scripture using other Scripture, we need to understand Jesus was telling them that they're arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom was despising God's little ones. Remember, we take Scripture in context. We just don't take one little bit of Scripture all because I'm preaching on chapter 18, verse 10 through 14. It doesn't mean that we forget about what happened previously. We, talk, we think about the argument that has just occurred. And Jesus is reminding them that you're despising one another with this kind of foolish talk. And it's a warning to us Christians. How easily, even the 12 who are one of these little children, they were despising one another when you try to put yourself above another. That's why when we see in the epistles, when, when Paul writes to make sure we don't think so highly of ourselves, it's a constant thing we need to be reminded. You know, he never tells us that we have to practice pridefulness, does he? We never, we're never told, well, make sure that you're prideful. No, that comes natural to us because it's sinful. What's hard for us to comprehend is humility, that people we come across, that we treat them better than we would treat ourselves. We surely don't disdain a, a fellow believer. Instead of their proud, self-seeking attitudes that created jealousy, envy, and resentment, they should have been showing concern for each other's welfare. They should have been building others up rather than themselves. Paul would write about this very issue in Romans chapter 12, verse 34, when he said, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, not, uh, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. See, now we come to the passage where people will... Um, forget that jesus is not only referring to the apostles but he's referring to us as well and we need to be careful that we don't do anything to cause ourselves to hinder the walk of another believer and to sustain somebody that god views as so precious now what else jumps at you here is now when we come to this passage here, where we get the word angel is mentioned. And a lot of people will wrongly come up with the notion that each believer is given a guardian angel. Now, there's no doubt that good angels help and protect God's people. Let me share some scripture with you. Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 20 through 23. As he came to near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Man, this is a guy just trying to kill him. And he's hoping the king lives forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. And they have not hardened me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I've done no harm. So when you think about that, here's another one. Acts chapter 2 and verse 52 they shows that they reveal information to us. Not only do they protect us, but they reveal information. Acts chapter 7, verse 52. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered who you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Not only do they protect, but they reveal information and they also guide. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And they also provide for. In Genesis chapter 21, verse 17. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened his eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin and water and gave the boy a drink. They also minister to believers in general. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, 
Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So it's obvious that angels, they minister to us, they provide for us, they guide, they reveal inf information, and they do protect. The question arises, though, do, do they, each of us, are we given a particular angel? Are we assigned an angel that watches over us from birth? The Old Testament tells us that the nation of Israel had an archangel Michael assigned to it. Daniel chapter 10, verse 21. But scripture nowhere, nowhere states that an angel is assigned to us as an individual. Angels were sometimes sent to individuals, but that is no, there is no mention ever of a permanent assignment of an angel given to a specific person to watch over them forever. The word there here, and this is important, I'm going to get a little bit scholarly on you here, and this the word there in the second sentence of verse 10 is a collective pronoun in the Greek and refers to the fact that believers are served by angels in general. These angels are pictured as always watching the face of God as to hear his command to them to help a believer when it is needed. The angel in this passage does not seem to be guarding a person so much as being ready and attentive to what the father would have him do. So yes, there are times when, in our lives when, when God provides us protection. Look, folks, I, as a police officer, I was shot at three times in my career. And I remember the first time before I was a Christian. It was one class that I was glad I paid attention to. Because they told you as a police officer, you never stand in front of a door when I come to visit your house to this day. You will see me, when you're looking through your little peephole, you'll see Kathy stand there, and I'll be off to the side. <laughs> There'll be Kathy. Sorry, babe. <laughs> but it's just an old habit. And I remember we went, uh, we went on a call, and uh, I was a 21-year-old rookie at Belmead Apartments out on, off of Jeff Davis Highway. And I got a call with a disorderly with a shotgun, and I won't go through all the details, but uh, when we knocked on the door, a shotgun blast through the front door, right through the front door, waist high. I would have been dead. When my son was in uh, Afghanistan, my wife, well, Jacob was in the 82nd Airborne, was there in combat for 27 months in FOB's uh, forward operating bases. And he came home and told a story to his mom about on his last mission on his first tour there. They had been there 12 months. Nobody had no casualties at all within uh, his unit. And uh, they got a call to help a special forces unit. A Green Beret unit had been ambushed and they got called to come there to, to, to uh, help them out. And next day they're flying out to come back to the States. And you can imagine what was going through everybody's mind. And as they go, and uh, Jacob was a driver at that time of a Humvee. He said, we're going up this mountain, and the bullets were flying. I'm opening my door, make sure we don't fly off the side of the road. And uh, bullets are hitting all over the place, Mom, but nothing came inside. And she said, I know why. Because I've been praying since the day you left that God would send his angels to protect you. There's other times that in my career that I think I should be dead, but I, I wasn't. I, I believe that God has, in His omnipotence and His will being done, has allowed all of us to survive things in our lives. And I'm not saying that God sends an angel every time that happens, but we know from Scripture that it does. But I don't want you to think that you've got an angel that you can name, that you can beckonly call him like he's some kind of genie that doesn't occur that way what we should be focused on folks is not the the things that are created by god but but the creator we shouldn't be focusing on any angels or worrying about worshiping angels what you should be focusing on is god and and seeking to do his will in your life so i'm again to remind you the angels in this passage do not seem to be guarding a person as much as waiting for the father in heaven so this brings us to our second point the father's desire look at verse 12 with me do you what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray does not uh, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go to search for the one that went astray and if he finds it truly i say to you he rejoices over it more 
than the 99 that never went astray. See, we must understand it's not the angels who are important in this passage. They have the interceding, they, they may be interceding on behalf of a weak or wandering Christian. And, in, and that's an encouraging thing to know as well. But what is really important here is that God is compared to the shepherd who seeks and finds the lost sheep. Why? Should we focus on angels when God has sent us a Savior in His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ? See, the parable tells us many important lessons about God. And and I'm going to, the lessons, there are going to be five lessons here, and they're going to go through two points of the sermon. So I'm going to start with the first lesson is God cares for us individually. God cares for us individually. You know, um, many of you probably know this. A farm I'm talking about. I when I used to work out in uh, northern end of Chesterfield County, and and still drive by that road on Robius Road from Powhatan. You coming in to Chesterfield, and on the left there's a there's a farm. Beautiful farm, beautiful place out there. And when you look over there, uh, you'll see I'll see a flock of sheep all the time out there. I'm just amazed at it. It's the only place that I see sheep around here, and they're and they're out there, and and I've watched them over the years, and. And, uh, and there's over a hundred of them out there. And when I see a hundred sheep in a meadow, I can't begin to imagine how a shepherd can distinguish that one sheep from another is missing. One, if one, if one is gone, one has been caught from a predator or he's wandered off. All sheep look alike to me. I look out that field. It's just like when I drive by, I know you guys who farm and you have cattle. You can probably tell the, which cow is which. Um, they all look alike to me and it's what it was all sheep they know but the shepherd the shepherd knows his sheep they know them individually and what is more their sheep know them and respond respond to their voices remember we know and i won't go into today we've all heard those lessons about how dumb sheep are i remember one person said if a sheep's born and if it happens to be born alive he spends the rest of his life trying to figure out how to commit suicide Kind of fits with us sometimes, doesn't it? The way we spiritually commit suicide, by walking away from God. But but, but these sheep, they, the, the shepherd cares about them. And the sheep know it. They, they know who loves them. Jesus was building on the fact that he told the people of his day, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, back in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay, my, I lay down my life for the sheep. We know that God knows his people individually and cares for them individually because when he calls them to faith, he calls them by name. John 10, 3. We see this clearly in this earthly ministry of Jesus. Think of Matthew himself. We are told that Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Jesus was the master. Matthew was a sheep, a lost sheep. He responded to the master's voice because he knew his master. He was a lost sheep who had been given to Jesus by the Father. Jesus called him by name, and when he did, Matthew recognized his master's voice, and he followed him. Zacharias was another lost sheep. He was a little man who could not see the Jesus as he passed by because of the large crowd of people. So he climbed up in a tree to get a better view. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. An even more powerful example occurred in Bethany. The brother of Mary and Martha was sick. Word was sent to Jesus, but Lazarus died before Jesus arrived. But Jesus stood before the tomb and cried loudly, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And he did. Lazarus was another of Jesus' lost sheep before he was saved, and he responded by returning here from the dead. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that Jesus knows your name? He is our master 
He is our shepherd. It's always that way. If you, if you are a believer, it is because God called you individually and when you heard Him call your name, you turned from trusting yourself. That was that moment. That was that moment when you realized when God was calling you, you weren't even probably looking for God at that time in your life. You heard the gospel proclaimed. You heard the truth that you were a sinner in need of a Savior. You heard the truth that all your life you've been trying, <coughs> excuse me, you've been trying to earn your salvation somehow, some way, because you had dabbled in all kinds of different religions and different faiths and different beliefs. And one day the simplicity of the gospel struck home to you. You might have been at home. You might have been your mom or dad tell, share the gospel with you. You might have been sitting in a church service. You might have been listening on the radio. You might have been in a hotel room all by yourself and opened a Gideon Bible. But, you, but the Holy Spirit convicted you that you were in a sinner in need of a Savior and that God sent His Son, His beloved Son, to die on a cross take the wrath and anger that God had against your sin and put it on His Son. And in that moment in time when God was calling your name, you believed in your heart that Jesus died for you. In that moment of time, you believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. In that moment of time, you believed that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And when you cried out to Him, you're crying out to Jesus, Save me. Only you could save me. At that moment when Jesus called my name, Mark, come. I heard my shepherd's voice. And like a dumb sheep ever since, I have wandered and strayed, but always I've been a part of the flock. And that's you, my brother and sister in Christ. We will always be a part of his flock. He will never abandon those who belong to him. See, this is the kind of relationship God has with his people. It's an individual relationship. We don't serve some, some God that cares not a minute about you. He cares so much for you that he sent his son to die for you. Contemplate that for a moment, if you will, as we thought about Thanksgiving this week and we think about the things that we're thankful for. How many times do you dwell on the fact that of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many times do you dwell on the fact that without God's love for you, if he hadn't called you by name, you'd be destined for hell forever? We have a relationship where he knows you. He knows me. He knows me and he loves me in spite of me. He didn't save me because of things I could do. He saved me because he loved me from the foundation of the world. If he called you by name when you first believed on Jesus, you can be sure that he will exercise that same individual care in keeping you and seeking you if you wander away. He cares for you. If you belong to him, he will not let you stray but so far. God's people will always return. You know, we see in Scripture sometimes, and we get, we get carried away with this verse, this passage of the lost lamb and we think well we got to stop ministering to the flock and go after that one christian who's not doing what he's supposed to no the scripture doesn't tell us that matter of fact paul tells us you let that person go turn him over to satan so what so that the body can be destroyed but the soul is saved you know sometimes christians need to be knocked on their butts hit rock bottom before they realize what they're doing to a holy god god allows us you know, we talk about free will in our lives. When God saved you and called you to be His, He gave you command. Deny yourself, Mark. Get yourself working every day for me. Not, it's not for you. It's for me. Loving your wife is for me. Providing for your family is for me. Dying to self, Mark, is picking up your cross daily and following me. It's all about me. It's not about you, Mark. And when you start making it about you, that's when you go astray. It's about him. And we need to remember that. 
And so, but I want you to understand something. You may be one in a hundred, but you're the one he will go to find to bring home if you go astray as well. He will bring you home. He will bring you home. That's the second, brings the second lesson I want you to learn today. God understands our weaknesses. God understands our weaknesses. I have never taken care of sheep in my life. Matter of fact, I've never taken care of anything other than dogs and cats. And, uh, and I admire people who do. My, uh, my sister married a farmer, a, far, a real farmer. He was a teacher and a farmer. And he, when I say real farmer, they're out in Minnesota where they have 10,000 heads of hogs. And they got tens of thousands of acres they're, they're harvesting out there in the big old machines out there. And I, I remember going to his, his dad's. So it was my sister's, my sister's father-in-law. And this was back when I was 12 years old. So it was 1968, back in the last century. And I remember going out to this farm. And I'd never been to a farm in my life. I remember I'm an army brat. The only thing I've ever been in was army bases. You know, I've seen soldiers march around. I've seen tanks driving around. I've seen all that kind of stuff but never seen, been on a farm. So I go out this farm, and I see these sheep. I think, it's pretty cool. I'm going to catch me one. <laughs> so I start chasing the sheep around. And my dad says, stop it. And, the, and, he go, and, and I remember Mr. McConkie said, don't worry, he'll never catch one. Well, I caught one. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I caught one. Didn't know what to do with it when I caught it, but I caught one. And I'm told that sheep are stupid creatures as well, and Probably the most stupid animals on earth, some people will tell us. And one way they show their stupidity is by easily wandering away. They can have a good shepherd who has brought them to the best grazing lands near an abundant supply of water. But they will still wander off to where the fields are barren and water undrinkable. The wonderful thing is that God does not rebuke us for being that stupid. Because isn't that what we do? How many times have you heard me say, here we were, slaves to sin, and God has freed us, removed those shackles, moved that bondage of sin that drags us down to the pits of hell, and he has set up over here on a pedestal, and he's made you slaves of righteousness. He has put this bounty before you of God's good, glorious life that he has in store for you. And yet, what do we want to do? We want to go back here where the pasture is nice and green and the water is flowing. We want to go over here because we like being chained to that sin and that nasty, muddy water and barely enough to eat because we think it satisfies us. And see, that's what you do, Christian. When you choose to sin, when you choose to go back, God has put a feast before you and you want to eat the garbage. God leads us to green pastures. He expects us to be obedient. The wonderful thing is that God does not slay me for my stupidity and my sin. The Bible tells us He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Aren't you glad that God is so merciful to us? The third lesson I want you to learn this morning is God seeks after us when we stray. God is sovereign. He directs the flow of history. He sets up kings and brings kings down. But seeking and saving lost sheep are the most important thing God does. Seeking the lost is the most important thing that God does. Jesus is described as the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world, Revelation 13, 8 tells us. This means God created the world. Understand this, that God created the world as a stage upon which the drama of a salvation would be acted out. Additionally, when Jesus came, he described his mission by saying in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save that was lost. That's why he was here. To save the lost. You see, one day when this drama is over and that final curtain comes down on that final act, the angels in heaven, the audience, and those who have been saved will praise the author and chief 
after crying out, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb by praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. See, we need to remember that God does not wait for us to come to him because we would not come. We wouldn't come. Romans 3.11 puts it very clearly. There's no one who seeks God. Let me say that again. There's no one who seeks after God. There is no one who seeks after God. He draws us to himself. And I love this in Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, Contemplate your own sin at this moment. Think of your own sin in your life. And think about how much that God loved you that in the midst of, of the worst debauchery, oh, and I know what some of you are sitting here thinking, well, preacher, I don't know what you're talking about me. I'm as good as gold, just ask my mom. If you don't believe my mom, ask my granny. She'll tell you how good I am. Well, here's the difference. God knows your heart. And he knows where your mind has strayed. He knows the actions that you've done. And you know, so this is one thing about the Bible. It, 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 it really, what it does, when we look at the Bible, when it pertains to how we live a life that's holy and pleasing to God, it just kind of rips us open, doesn't it, to the core. There are no excuses. We're laid bare before the Father. And if we're honest, we all we can cry out, all we can do is be that man and woman at the back of the church and hit in our chest. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Because that's what you did when you got saved. Don't be so prideful now that you can't do the same thing. God, thank you for having mercy on me, a sinner. Without you, Father, I'd still be lost. The fourth lesson, God rejoices when we repent repent and return to him god rejoices the greeks believe god could not have emotions do you know that they believe that they couldn't have emotions because if he did and if we're the cause of his emotions whether grief anger sorrow love or dismay then to that extent we would have power over god and we'd be able to control him that may be reasonable for a philosopher to think that but it is not what the bible teaches us The Bible says that God grieves. Do you know he grieves over your sin? When you commit sin, he grieves over it. When I sin, I grieve my Father in heaven. You know, there's not a person in here that that doesn't have somebody close to them. And if you love that person and you cause them grief, what does it usually do? For me, it puts knots in my stomach. When when I know I've caused somebody grief, it, it... It upsets me, and I want to make it right. Isn't it amazing, Christian, how we don't feel that same way about God when we grieve Him with sin and we don't have a a desire to repent of that sin and keep committing that same sin over and over again? God says that, the Bible says that God grieves over that. Jesus makes this explicit in this parable, saying that the great shepherd, He rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. In the story of the prodigal son, in Luke chapter, uh, back in Luke, uh, he, he, he too was lost, right? Having squandered his parents on a wild living, but at last he came to his senses and went back to his father to confess his sin and to seek a place as a servant, as a slave. And some people will still to this day think of this story chiefly about the son. We even call it the parable of the prodigal son, but it's actually about the father who represents God The father was longing for his son, waiting for his return. And when he saw his son coming, you remember what happened? The father ran into him and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Then he said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. Never Dear one, ever think that 
if you go back to God, you will find him angry at you. Don't think he will be distant or vindictive. Everything God has done for your salvation, and I want you to think about that, and I want you to think that no one in all the universe will be happier when you repent of sin. The one you sin against. He's waiting, Christian, for you this morning to repent of that sin that you're in rebellion against him to this day. Now that brings us to the fifth lesson and the final point of the sermon. Look at verse 14, the will of the Father, and that's where I'll go with the fifth lesson. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So the fifth lesson, God's pursuit of the lost is effective. God's pursuit of the lost is effective. We might suppose if all we are thinking about is the parable of the prodigal or that the son might not have returned and that the love of the father might have been frustrated. But that was not what Jesus was getting at. Jesus was emphasizing God's joy over recovering whatever had been lost. That is what it means in the parable of the lost sheep. The father seeks for them, those that are lost, until he finds them and brings them back home. Remember that Jesus is teaching the disciples how they are to care for weak believers, the little ones, who are in view throughout this whole chapter. He is not teaching that all people will be saved. This doctrine known as universalism is not taught in Scripture. He is teaching about the perseverance of the saints, the belief that not even one of those who has been given to Jesus by God will perish. This is what Jesus teaches in John 10, the chapter we think of most often when we think of Jesus as a shepherd. In chapter 10, after he has spoken how they will call his sheep and how they will hear his voice and follow him, Jesus says this, I give them eternal life. Jesus speaking here, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus makes it perfectly clear that as a believer, you can never lose your salvation because you are part of His flock and you are His sheep. I close with these comments. We might consider the shepherd leaving the 99 to find the one this way. I want to take you back when I was 35 years old. Suppose, and this is a, not a true story, but I'm going to tell you a story here. Suppose when I was 35 and my daughter who is sitting here now would have been 10. Sean would have been 8. Jacob would have been 6. And the twins would have been 1. I'm asleep. Kathy and I are in our bedroom upstairs. My children are upstairs in the house. We're all asleep. And all of a sudden, the smoke detectors go off. I wake up, and I find the house filled with smoke, and I can see fire in my house. Panic just overcomes me at that moment. I race, get my wife out, race to go get my kids out of the house. I go to the bedrooms, and and I begin to make sure that I get them up, calling to the older ones, telling Crystal, Sean, get out of the house. Making sure Jacob is out of the house. I go to the baby's rooms. I carry Joshua out of the house. I go down and in the lawn, away from everybody, there's my wife. There's Crystal. There's Sean. There's Jacob. There's Joshua. Where's Jesse? They're all safe. They're all in the house. I wouldn't give a second thought to leave them to go back in and find the one that's lost. God is our Father. And He counts His kids. And He rejoices for the ones that are safe and the lost but he will never leave the one 
until it's safely back in the flock. It's the message of the parable. Christian, that should give you so much peace in your life. And if you truly have come to saving faith in him, that you will belong to him. And so Christian, I challenge you this morning. Does your life reflect that you're safe out on the lawn with God? Or are you one that has a tendency to continue to stray back into sin? Don't eat with the pigs. Come to the table of the Lord. Celebrate this morning as we celebrate the Lord's resurrection, as we celebrate what He did for us. Lay your sin at the feet of the altar of God this morning. Turn from that sin that's in your life, whatever it is, Christian. To the one who doesn't know Christ as Savior. He's calling you. Are you the one this morning? Are you the one that's watching online? Are you the one that God's calling you by name? Repent of your sins. Acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. That he paid the price that you could not pay. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Christian, we are entering that season when life becomes so busy, we get caught up in the things of the world, and not necessarily bad things or evil things, but Father... I would ask that as you contemplate your father this morning, Christian, I would ask as you contemplate what Christ has done for you, I would ask that this morning, when was the last time that you preached the gospel to yourself? When was the last time that you, as scripture says, put on the full armor of God each day? You know what it tells us to do it every day? Paul says, die to self every day. Jesus says, deny yourself daily. Follow him. Scripture tells us, put on the full armor of God. Why do you think it's always constantly tell us to do it, do it, do it? Because it's very simple for us to lay our armor aside. It's very simple for us to forget the gospel. It's it's easy for us to forget to deny ourselves. It's easy for us to die to self and live for the world. Oh, it doesn't cost you salvation, but it costs you so much of the joy that God has planned for your life. The peace that passes all understanding when we are obedient to Him. So, as we wait for Christmas to celebrate it, as we celebrate the birth of our Savior, I'd ask you to do this as you open up your Advent calendars, as you count the days to Christmas. I would ask that each day, you start with a prayer acknowledging the gospel to yourself asking God to help you die to self and deny yourself this day and go to Ephesians chapter 6 and open up the book and meditate on the full armor of God each and every day so many of you have drifted from the faith oh not your saving faith but just the faith that brings you peace in your life. What a no better time to confess that to the one who left the 99 to save you. Father, Lord, you are everything to me. And yet I still fail you. I still desire things of this world. Lord, I still failed to deny myself each day. Forgive me for that, Lord. Help me as I just pleaded with your people to do the exact same thing that I've just asked them to do, Lord. Father, you have called us out of this world. Help us to represent you. Help for people to see us as different than the world. Help us to treat our enemies with love. Help us to pray for those who hate us. 
Help us, Father, live our faith for you. I pray for your will to be done here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, I'll stand up front and it's our time of for you to come and make decisions public. The Bible tells us that when we come to saving faith, we're to we're make that decision public. The Bible says, Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. God has called you to saving faith this morning, this past week, this past month, this past year, and you've never made that public. You come and you let this preacher know. Some of you never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. The Bible says to believe and to be baptized. What hinders you from being obedient to God? We won't baptize you this morning. I'll sit with you and share with you the, why we are and why it's so important to be baptized. Some of you, God has spoken to you a way I could never imagine today. I pray that you get right with the Lord today. Whatever your decision, you come and you let this preacher know. In Jesus' precious name, I ask all of that. Amen. Let's all stand.